Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Don't miss out on our comic book creator interviews, including our monthly Chichester chats with comic book legend D.G. Chichester, superhero movie brackets in our search for the worst comic book movie of all time, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes or go to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another month of the Chichester Chats. Of course, I am Phil. There's Lilith. And of course, the man himself, the man who wrote the greatest battle of the West Coast Avengers ever, Mr. D.G. Chichester. Hello, sir. The cover copy does not lie. So we, we know this is a fact. It says it right there. And uh, I'm, exactly. I'm happy to take uh, credit for it. Co-credit for it. You know, Co-credit, was, yeah. It was co-written, but uh, uh, it... Uh, it, it was a, an amazing accomplishment, and that's why I never returned to the West Coast Avengers, frankly, because you really, you know, you've hit the you apex. Leave it right, though, right, like you're George right out, right, right out, exactly. Right. <laughs> it's the Costanza chats now. We've moved on to it. It's yes. <laughs> We love Seinfeld. But, uh, yeah, no, this was another fill-in. So I'm assuming what an editor came to you and said, hey, we need a, a uh, fill-in for West Coast Avengers this month? Or uh, No, this was the hard scrabble uh, time. This was this was nobody wants to hire you. This is uh, <laughs> this is your on your on staff uh, and, you know, desperately, not desperately, but desirously wanting to to move into something else, you know, to, to try to uh, exercise the writing skills, pick up some extra green, uh, on staff editors were not paid well. I'm sure they're probably still not paid well, uh, all in comparison. So there were a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of talented nepotism, you know, going on. Certainly if you look at the credits, there's a lot of editors who are writing things, assistant editors who are writing things using the ability, the, using the fact that there were, inside the walls to try to also open things up. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, certainly I'd come out of, out of film school, uh, took the job at Marvel for various different reasons, which we might have touched on, but, um, but I, I, I wanted to, to get to writing both from a financial point of view and also cause that's ultimately what I wanted to do. And, um, and so, but I wasn't confident enough to, to, to do it on my own. And Margaret Clark, who was one of the other editors at at, uh, at Epic, and uh, you know we had struck up a, a good relationship, a good friendship. Uh, we would later date for a long while, but this pre this predated that. Um, and uh, but we had, we said you know maybe if we if we start writing together, we can um, uh, you know get more people interested because we you know. She had a certain group of people she was connected with. I had a certain people I was connected with, and uh, and so we just started pitching things, and we pitched uh, a lot of strange things. You know, Thundercats. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, um, there was a uh, there was a group of like uh, there's another comic uh, cartoon tie-in that we pitched uh, something Defenders of the Universe or something had like Mandrake the Magician and a bunch of other ones. Um, so uh, this was written as a fill-in with a lot of desperate clawing at, at Mark Grunwald's office and Howard Mackey, who was the assistant. And, you know, can you give us a shot? Can you give us a shot? Can you give us a shot? Here's an idea. Here's an idea. Here's an idea. Um, and, uh, and, and so finally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably more just to get rid of us. <laughs> you know, the, the idea was uh, accepted and, and written and then put in the drawer as a pure, fill in. So there was a chance that this might never, ever, ever run. Um, and so the fact that it did run meant that there was a blip in the schedule, uh, at some point and, uh, and then it got pulled out and, uh, 
you know, you can see if you've read the story, there's a couple of, uh, there's at least a page, I think, and then a couple of panels that are really were, seems like they were added after the fact, like, like the kind of set up flashback from, I think, Wonder Man or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why I didn't know how planned it was. Cause yeah, it's like a first page. And I think yeah. the last page is just like framing devices. It's like, okay, well, this is taking place during current continuity, but meanwhile, you know, Wonder Man just sitting on the Quinjet reminiscing. It's like, oh, I remember it, when we really were a team? It, exactly. Exactly. It, you know, it's just an awkward thing, but that wasn't something that we had written. And, and mm. you can, you get the sense, um, or at least I do umpteen years later, uh, you know, both for practical purposes and writers who, who are kind of learning to do what they want to do. This is so plot driven. This is so, this is like a through line of, of just action, 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 right? There's, there's no, there, there's nothing here except propelling the story forward. So it's, it's, it's easy for editors. They don't have to worry about, well, geez, you're, you're mucking about with so-and-so's relationship and the regular yeah. writer, John Byrne or whatever, he's not going to like that. All we did was have a, a goofball adventure. And then, and then I'm sure at that point, uh, Mark and uh, Mark Grunwald and Howard Mackey, didn't even come to us for those framing devices. I think they just, they probably just wrote them on their own. Um, oh yeah. I, yeah. I'm sure, you know, McGrunewald was very continuity uh, focused and stuff. But yeah. I could see that, but I think we've discussed this before, but it's like villains are, I mean, ha, are they kind of difficult because it's like, yeah, you really can't mess with any of the ongoing stuff or anybody's relationship. It's like Iron Man has his own book. You really can't, you know, change much with him. Yeah, I, I think that there's there's different ways um, to approach it, where uh, if uh, if you're in a good relationship with the say the regular creative team, you know when Greg Wright would would do some fill in issues, fill in issues really kind of you know on Daredevil, you know I'd hand off certain things to him because I was busy with something else or I was setting up Electra or or different things where I wanted to get ahead of stuff because he and I had a had just a great creative and and friendly relationship. Um, I I I didn't care what he did in a way. I knew he was going to treat everything with respect and put it mm-hmm. in the right place. And he would even say, "I want to do this. Is that going to be okay?" And we'd be like, "Great, you know, because the other half of my brain working, <laughs> the better half of my brain working in service, you know, to a story." Um, a fill an issue like this is more the editorial pure play of a, a smart editor setting things up for ongoing success. At some point, something is going to go wrong with the schedule, right? On, a, on, an, on an ongoing book that you have to kind of deliver on every month, something's going to go wrong. Uh, uh, the package is going to be delivered on time. In those days, we had packages that would come through the mail or FedEx. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, a, a creator would just sometimes drop the ball. Somebody would get sick. Um, act of God, whatever. So you had to plan ahead and just have this stuff sitting there. So from um, a creative point of view, I, I think they're, uh, you know, if you can just have fun with the characters, that's all you want to do. And that's that's what we were trying to, that's all you have to do, rather. And I think that's what we were trying to do here was have fun with the characters, treat them right, because Mark would slap us if <laughs> if we didn't. Um, and we, you know, we tried and we, we, uh, I assume succeeded since they bought the story, but you know that you're not going to set up something that, well, when I get the book, I'll pay off, I'll pay off on all this. I'm not going to get the book. Uh, I'm not going to get this character out of this, but you might demonstrate certain things of how you handle a character, or maybe you unpack something that you, you, um, you get to, uh, uh, then leverage more later because you, you demonstrated that you, you could play in the world. You could play in the, you know, in the, um, uh, with the characters and, and for myself and Margaret, this was one of the bigger first times we were playing with the real characters, right? Thundercats, who cares? Uh, whatever the, uh, the, um, the, no, I'm not saying, but I'm saying from continuity. Point, I from mean, a, I worked from a Epic, Marvel standpoint. Lilith, yeah. Lilith, I worked at Epic for, you know, a number of years and we did some substantial work with substantial creators and, big names and big books and well-produced, you know, comics and, uh, and groundbreaking stuff. I would, I would say, 
Nobody cared on the Marvel side. Nobody cared. Nobody knew what the hell we were doing. It, it was it wasn't a Marvel Universe title. So in the same way, Thundercats is a fun property. I even remember. Gosh, I wish I could remember the name of that that book. I'll have to look it up later. The uh, the the other cartoon uh, mixed together Flash Gordon Mandrake was it was it the, was it Defenders of the Earth or something like that? That was it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I, 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 I remember Defenders that cartoon. The, yeah, right. Defend. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Defenders of the Earth. So um. You know, short lived, but, but fun to work with. Yeah. Um, nobody cared, right? But West Coast Avengers, right? You're dealing with a lot of, uh, primo characters. So you've got well, to perform. Well, Wonder Man excluded. I'm kidding. Well, Wonder I'm Man, kidding. Wonder, how dare you? Guys, <laughs> gotta show. What... I will, I will yeah, be man. shocked. You I will be show. shocked if, yes, if his show does not pick up on the storyline. I guarantee you that we were going to see that this, the events of this West the Coast greatest Rangers battle he was ever in. Yeah, of course, they're going to pick this. Up. It's got to be referenced, right? It's got to come through. And uh, but but so I, I think there's there's um, you could feel like you're not advancing something, but you could also just have a lot of fun with it. And I think that in our goofy, multiple referenced uh, what was going on in the world way, you know, we had fun. We 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 ran with it. We, we obviously fell in love in in. The strange way, maybe too much, with Pim's little Pim particle things and playing with all this, the resizing. Pim particles are fun, man. <laughs> Pim particles are fun, right? We'd all we'd all love some Pim particles. In the, that's in what the, the character house, was right? at the time. It's like that's you know, exactly you right. have a Dr. Pim. 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 Just right. Dr. Pim. Just throw right. stuff out of his pocket just, and his, enlarge his, it. Yeah, it's like it's like a bag of wonders. It's it's you know it's a little Felix the Cat thing going on there. Just but, pull, so pull I always whatever. feel like a fill-in issue can go one of two ways. Either you do a bottle issue. Or mm-hmm. you just go out and just have have a fun adventure. Like I feel like those are pretty much the only two. Well, what what would be the like. difference between the the two? What do you mean by the bottle adventure? Well, they're versus... just in like one location and everybody's talking and having shawarma. You know? Oh 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 okay 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 <laughs> all right I, I could see this. Whereas, as like being... you know I like the fun approach where they go out and just have an inconsequential adventure. Right 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 <laughs> and that's kind of what. This is, even though this is the greatest battle ever, that you could have. It's not hard to co- do with West Coast Avengers. I'm, I'm the just other, saying. The, the other cover copy was the most inconsequential adventure ever, but that didn't play as well in focus groups. Yeah, so marketing didn't greatest. like that. Yeah, marketing didn't go with that one. But uh, but yeah, I mean that that's it, right? From you, you turn the page, it's like page one. Forget the fill in intro, right? It's by page two. You know they're all over it, right? Uh, confronting the defiler and. <laughs> It was man. There was there was obviously a sale on lumber that week, right? You know the defiler, his group's corruption. It's just it's like man, it was the eighties. Leave me alone. The eighties and the nineties. Yeah, you're just you're just all into it. No, I lo- I like the character, but there's like one page. I think it's page twelve. I know this is a Chichester page because it's just pun after pun after pun. It's like Hawkeye shoots a net arrow. He's like, oh, this will net us some results or something. I'm just like, that's a Chichester page. It has to be. Well, there was always a lot of back, you know, when, when, when we worked together, uh, there was definitely a, uh, at that point, you know, for, for this book, uh, for other things later on, it, it would, it would change a little bit, but there, there was always a vetting process. You know, we, we were, we were extraordinarily fair with each other, uh, in the sense of it wasn't, it wasn't like one person, uh, plot it and the other person script it or, or I would script three pages and then she would script three pages. It was, it was a, it was sitting down and kind of going over every, every single thing. So somebody would say, here's a line, here's a thought. And then we'd vet it back and forth. I don't know if it was the most efficient way, but it, it was, it was a good, it was a good partnership, you know, to, to play that stuff out and definitely thinking through even the rock band stuff and what's going to come out of Pim's particles and all that stuff uh, was was played out as a as a writing partnership. So I certainly learned a lot uh, working with her on on even something like this. No, the only thing I was missing, I was like, "Oh, where's our origin for the Defiler, man? Where, where's this guy come from?" I know it was like it's another two thousands. We don't need an origin for everything. Well, you no, know, but like back in the eighties, they give you like one page. It's like, oh, I come from another dimension, and I just feed on uh, you know all these other. We're universes. gonna trust our audience. It's fine. That's, <laughs> see, I, I mean. Uh, DG Chichester, trust you guys to be smart, unlike other creators. No anvils needed. <laughs> I I don't I don't want to uh, give away any spoilers or take too much credit, but I do want to say, you know, a defiling character, another dimension, dragging people into it. I don't want to say that Stranger Things, you know, read the story and 
and moved in that direction with Vecna. But uh, I, I again have to sort of say it probably was an inspiration for. We'll start the rumor. We don't. You know. <laughs> so you may ultimately see in the second part of the Stranger Things season four a reference to the Defiler. It might happen. You know, they're not the entire DD. Make this right. You know, it's it's um. It's an interesting, almost editorial point, though, you, you make uh, that that wasn't a request, you know, as we put the story forward. We're, again, we were very fledgling at this point, although we'd, we'd later become way too uh, pretentious for our own good. Uh, we'd flip to the other direction, you know, <laughs> in overthinking everything. This was just such pure play, um, you, you know, juggling of plot events setting up a story that wasn't going to get in the way of editorial um, and that, but also juggling so many characters uh, out of the gate, maybe the Thundercats pitch and the defenders of the earth pitch experience was helpful, but I would not recommend a big group book as kind of one of your big forays out of the gate. You know, before that we had done most of the things we had pitched had been, I would say one or two characters and the things we had actually sold had probably been one or two characters. The Solo Avengers story we had done, mm. which was an eight-page story, 12-page story at most, and um, and the Justice uh, story we had done for the, the New Universe uh, were eminently solo adventures. And uh, so to suddenly go in, you've got eight, nine, you know, characters, plus a villain, plus this, plus that. Um, maybe it was good. Maybe that was good to go in on the deep end. And I know it's a one and done, and it's like kind of like a big battle scene. But was there yes. any was there any like one Avenger where you're like, you know what? I kind of liked writing this character more than the other ones. I would be interested in maybe doing something more with this character. Obviously, it's Pim. Obviously, yeah, obviously it's Pim. <laughs> obviously, um, oh, he could have redeemed Hank Pym. <laughs> I did. You know, I do remember liking Pym a lot, and I do remember uh, even though we started off, this is kind of goofy, and the thing that's been set up for him. Uh, but we couldn't change that, you know, midway through. But I do, I do remember liking that quite a bit, but not in a way of suddenly saying, "Oh, geez, we're gonna we're gonna pitch a Hank Pym, uh, you know, storyline yeah. or, or miniseries." I think we were just so happy to you know, sell through <laughs> a story um, and uh, and get it accepted and get paid for it and be able to say, "All right, we did this one," and, and then bug. Uh, you know, whenever Howard or Mark's probably more Howard's strategy to, to kind of get rid of us, uh, you know, it only became the double down. Well, you bought one. Do you want to buy another one now? You know, so it wasn't like he chased us away. It was more like, oh, this guy's a sucker. And, you know, he's opened the door to us. Um, Do you remember getting a lot of notes on this? Not so much. I don't remember. Um, I, I remember, for example, many more notes on that eight page solo venture story which i think i mentioned before in the past uh, always being shocked and and uh and just so pleasantly uh surprised uh how much time mark grunwald took with us sitting down on that eight page story and going through this is what works this is what doesn't work and this is what doesn't work and this is what doesn't work for an eight page story with a with a with a character dr druid you know so far off the main uh, path that it, it's kind of crazy, but that's the sort of care that he took both in his responsibility to the characters and the, and the people he was working with. Um, but I don't remember many notes on, on this. Um, uh, and I can see the sort of editorial, um, strong hand of not even going back to the writing team and asking for changes so there's there's one thing as i was skim reading this uh, in prep for for this um somebody says something like good grief you know as an exclamation right i would never write good grief in, in, even if i was doing even if i was doing charlie brown right you know, so like that, as i'm wearing my my charlie brown emoji shirt today um i i, I would not write good grief and uh, and neither would margaret uh, so that was obviously we'd written who knows what goddamn or, you know, trying to be edgy. Uh, we'd written something and then somebody came in and said, I'll just write, we'll just, we're never going to go back to them and, and give them the chance to correct it. They just put stuff in there. Um, so, uh, so any notes that might have affected things like that, they just Lilith ran with on their own. 
and didn't feel a need. <laughs> how's the how's the story look? Oh, great! It looks great, except that, you know that epic guy had to throw in a god damn. We'll change that to good grief. Okay, <laughs> exactly, or something. You know, you keep just, your epic habits over there. <laughs> every now and again, you, you'll skim read you know some of the stuff, and especially in preparation for things like this, and you, yeah. you know I'll see like a bo- a baloney, you know, <laughs> or you know, or some. Or something like that, that I wrote, I wrote something else and somebody swapped it to uh, that type of exclamation, which, again, I would never use. And I don't think any of the characters would ever use. But there was a I would have gone back to to the writer and I would have said, hey, this doesn't work. Give me give me another thing. But I realized, um, you know, talking with Howard a couple of years ago on a on a on a podcast, the 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 Marvel mentality was just very much your editorial runs the show and and therefore we're just going to do whatever we want with your stuff um which is probably the right attitude but coming out of epic i had a different i had a different mentality i i I knew i was the authority on certain things and i was the last stop on on certain things but because so much of it was creator owned we had come with it from a from a different point of view of drawing the creative um uh, talent more into the discussion and we might still change things, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, based upon what was best for the story of the book. Um, but uh, so from Howard's point of view, that was, you know, the, the absolute right way to go. So that I don't put that forward as any kind of like, my goodness, my, my expletive was so much better for this. Um, it's the greatest expletive ever. Um, they ruined it with a good grief, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of, when you read stuff like that, it's always like, just weird, right? <laughs> this is 1935. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wah, wah. You know, gosh, gosh, Hawkeye. You know what will we do today? Well, I think that I think at this point, even you know, by the time you get to dare, your Daredevil run, it was starting to change already. But I think at this point, they're all like, "Oh, we're gonna have all these kids reading this." You know, we can't be, you know, yeah, kids, <laughs> kids, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and you never want anything that's that's t- too off the you know, off the beam. I'm sure I didn't write goddamn either, yeah. but I didn't write good grief. So somewhere in between there is the truth. And maybe if you scratch the page hard enough, it's under. <laughs> it's like, it's like the people cut up in their fun coast thinking they're going to find a brain inside. You know, it's like, Oh look, I saw this on TikTok. You know? Bro, this just gives me, that gives me such anxiety. <laughs> it just like opens a toy around me. I'm like, what are you doing? Leave it in the package. I did that once at a convention. I bought these James Bond uh, toys, like these ones from like the sixties or something, and and I just I opened them up in front of the guy I just bought them for from. I thought he was his heart fall broke, over. bro. And pretty much, he was like, "Oh, what are you doing?" It's like I want to want to see the little mechanism. I want to see how the I want to see how the pool table flips over. You know, it's kind of. Like... I, I I took it out of the plastic, but I haven't opened the box. Ooh, look at that! Ooh. Nice. <laughs> yeah, GI Joe is a. Uh... Is my current like obsession right now? So oh, really, <laughs> like the old toys and stuff, they're amazing. Yeah, you know, oh, they were. Oh, they are. Yeah, Kung Fu Grip. I had the um, as a kid. I'm sure it's it, long, long gone. I had the Apollo space capsule, which was oh, the best. Shit. You know, it was like wow. they would fit inside there. It was like, amazing. So one of those primo toys of like, oh my god, this is so incredible. And then long gone. Three weeks later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We we never know what we have at the time. So many Barbies that I'm like when I look at the exactly. when I'm looking at the collectors. Oh, I had that one and I the, cut her hair. The the greatest tragedy I ever know. My father as a ch- as a child had like you know the first couple issues of Avengers, Spider Man. Uh-huh. You know I'm sure that my grandmother threw them out. I'm like no. Go on, go on. Yep. Retirement fund, no. <laughs> Oh, that's just like I found some um, Tarzan and like Lost in Space comics, you know, those Edward uh, Edward Rice Burrow books and stuff from like uh-huh. the 60s. And they were in absolute atrocious condition, yellow, torn, ink on the page. There was like a bullet hole through one. And I was just oh so gosh. sad. Oh, I, was, I wanted to buy them, but they were in such terrible condition. There was no way to restore them. I was just so sad when I saw that. Right, right. Yeah, it just kicked around completely. I mean, that's just epic pieces of, you know, pop culture will never get back. You know, the Twilight mm-hmm. Zone, the original Twilight Zone comics. And I, was, I was devastated. Oh, wow. That's a, like, <laughs> smoke. And I'm just like, oh, why did people have to smoke so much back then? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. That's why that stuff's worth so much. Those, those comics didn't last, you know. they did great. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, do you um back to this? I was gonna say, do you remember um how long it was between uh you and Margaret like creating this issue and them like actually publishing it since since it was a two fill-in? years later. <laughs> It was a it was a stretch. I don't remember what it was. It wasn't years, but yeah. it was definitely um, it was definitely one of those things of of a, a, a few months at least. You Do know, they tell you, or does the does the comic just show up in your office? Like here, you no, he taught we we uh, Howard Howard or Mark. Um, you know, somebody said, "Oh, it's going to run," um, and, and so that was you know, that was a thrill. Um, but. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't a surprise we didn't get our comics bundle and you know leafing through and say wow the greatest battle ever i wonder what that is you know oh my gosh i <laughs> I, I wrote it um the uh um but it was it it was definitely a a little bit of a stretch of time because i remember it sort of going back to being you know making this the, the sale wasn't suddenly oh the floodgates open now they recognize our amazing talents and and we're uh you know we're uh were ripe, uh, were ripe with uh, success and and assignments. We were uh, we were definitely back to uh, you know working the system. You know trying to trying to sell a, another story uh, in that way. Um, but but um, I do remember vaguely. You know Howard. You know probably saying, "Oh, it's going to run in whatever issue, issue thirty eight. So. I mean, I appreciate that. I mean, yeah, back in the day, like, you know, you, even if you just got a fill-in issue, they gave you something every month. These days, for, you know, writing for the trades, it's like, oh, we're going to be late a month. You're not going to get your, you know. Or event- three. Month. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? That they didn't, they don't, they don't have. Well, again, thing? like, if something's late, they're just going to be like, yeah, you're not getting an Avengers this month. That's how they do oh, it now. Oh, really? There, yeah. There's not. Yeah. I, yeah, I, no, I don't there's follow there's, enough things on a month-to-month basis. Yeah, there's this thing as a fill-in this time. Yeah, I know. If the team's late, it's late. Really? Uh-huh. So there's no like there's no maintenance of of the schedule. Yeah, on a it's been like basis. that for a couple of years. I won't get it might be pandemic related. Who I knows? I was gonna That's say yeah, we I, really started yeah. noticing it, but yeah. In the, in these days, it might just be the supply chain. Yeah, it might not even be the creators. It might just be yeah, we can't get unless it there. it's you know that one person. <laughs> it it <laughs> might also be DJ's, DJ, DJ's here. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. Uh, I don't know this for a fact. I wonder if there's a difference in. Um, you know, the way things are printed. I mean, one of the reasons of maintaining the schedule was because I believe, you know, there were, there were set things that had to run at set times. So yeah. I think there was, that was part of the, the payment agreement with the, with the printers and everything else. So if you miss that, you were going to eat that cost um, or throw the whole, um, you know, throw the whole uh, uh, larger print schedule uh, off in that way beyond a gap in the book. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe today's digital printing, not, not, you know, electronic comics, but even just the fact that you can now send digital files over and such, and um, probably the way that they're printed, uh, maybe that gives more latitude and they don't have to worry about fill-in issues as much. Again, I don't think, I don't know if they want to like, since everything gets collected in a trade now, if they want to like break up that trade with like a different creative team or something, even... Maybe. I don't know. Who knows how much they yeah. think about the that. The model forward. is very weird now. I, I just wish for a simpler time, honestly. And we're getting that. You know, we're all going back to the 90s at this point. Everything yeah, Marvel did a bunch 90s. of 90s stuff. Yeah, no. Stranger Things, the, the sequel, the next se- se- the, you know, the next series in Stranger Things is going to be in the 90s, obviously. Just like that 90s show. So happy for that. <laughs> it's got to catch up somewhere. But yeah, those you know, actors are getting too old. But uh, it's... um. Yeah, I saw they're uh, not only are they doing the midnight the midnight suns with the U game. Now there's a midnight suns with the U comic. Uh, yes, so, uh, you know, which has <laughs> nothing to do that I could tell with midnight suns except for I saw Blade on the cover and Ghost Rider, and, uh, but nice. whatever. <laughs> the, 90s, difference, 90s. the difference between one letter, you're like, oh, we're not gonna pay him anything. <laughs> the O U. That's essentially it, Phil. I mean, not that I'm sure they're playing against us in that way, but it's just, mm-hmm. I guess there's there's probably a, I have no idea what it is. Like a legal thing? No. no, I don't I don't think it's a legal thing. I, I think it's, I don't know what it is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe it felt too male-oriented with the uh, sons. Maybe, or, yeah. Um, uh, but that was, I, I have no clue. Because I don't know what Midnight Suns with a U means. Because Midnight Sun with an O was you know it was just it, it was just, we were just playing off the fact that we were like they're children we're, of the night damn it children of the night exactly <laughs> exactly um so in 99% of those characters were 
were male, but, um, so. Well, that's why they made it Lilith, and they gave you some venom, so, you know. <laughs> I, I guess. I, I, we'll, yeah. we'll see what shows up with it. Yeah, the new ones, I don't even know if it's, like, a lot of the same characters, because I saw, like, I saw Wolverine on one cover. I no, like, so they, they threw yeah. in a bunch of other characters. There's Wolverine, there's Spider-Man. Yeah, there's Man, Iron Man the even game. in there, so. Right, so I don't well, know. Well, yeah, it's, the, a, it's, it's a, it's a yeah. video game. Unless, giant, unless right? they're all somehow suddenly supernaturally powered Spider-Mans and and Wolverines, which I guess is possible. They've, they've, this has been done before, yeah. So. Yeah, right, right, right. But I, I, all right. And again, this West Coast Avengers, like the tie, like the uh, fill in issues. Could you go to like any office at this point and be like, hey, can I, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, was absolutely. everyone looking for fill in stuff? We, yeah. we were, we were scrabbling at the door of, of everybody, you know, in a, in a pathetic way. And, and, um, and, and that's how some people, but that's made, how you have to make, big, that's how you had to make your bowl. Well, yeah. Then. I mean, and this is, this is no, and he was a machine. He was a machine. Scott Lobdell was a machine, you know, in term, you know, Scott Lobdell, famous writer of many of the X-Men titles and, and other things. And, um, but, but Scott was a, was a, a far more efficient machine than, than say we were. He would show up with donuts and bagels and, you know, what, what do you got? 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 What do you, <laughs> you know? And even if it just becomes the wearing down of like, here, just go away. Here's here. Do go do twenty two pages or something. Well, with that, which you also busy for a while. right. But then you also demonstrate if you're if you're good at what you're doing, um, you demonstrate certain things to an editor. I can deliver on time. I did twenty two page assignment. Here it is the next day. Whoa! I didn't think you'd do do it that fast. Um, but shows me you can write a twenty two page story that holds up well in a day. So when I get into a crunch, or if you're if you were to ever become my regular writer, um, yeah. or one of my regular creative people, it shows me that you can you can produce, and this isn't half bad, um, and uh, and you don't even own these characters, and you're treating them with respect, and so you're demonstrating certain things with that. But definitely every office was they're in the same they're in the same predicament, and maybe yeah. they're not doing that today, but there's going to be that moment where even the best um, the best creative team may run into a situation uh, that something fell to the side or somebody got sick or whatever, whatever. And, and so having that extra issue or two uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, drawer, you know, and being able to look ahead on the schedule and say, yep, we're falling behind. This is going to be a problem in March or something. Uh, and then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pull out that fill in plot and I'm going to get it. Now I'm going to get it illustrated. Uh, you know, so, or if you were being hyper efficient, you might just have planned out that entire fill in issue and then gotten that ready to go because there was a certain budget, I think, allowed as overage, you know, where you could have a fill in issue just ready to go. So that could be complete, lettered, inked, colored, rubber band snapped around it and, and just set, you know, so when you see you're ready to go, well, then 38 is going to become this. And See, then, I like that peek behind the editorial curtain. I, I yes. think people don't really appreciate editors as, as much as they should. Uh, some editors can be horrible, but most editors are great. It's a huge I, responsibility. I mean, it's a huge. I mean, you're juggling, and you're juggling um, your you if you if you, you're trying to help the people create a story. You've hired be them. An advocate for them as well and, when yes, you know marketing yes. and the suits come knocking. Right, and but you also have to be responsible to the larger schedule and keeping things on time and making sure people are doing the right things by the character. You know, somebody comes in and and wants to do um, uh, something that's completely off the beam for for a character. Here, I'm going to have Daredevil rip the the door off this cab. Right, I think I might have told that story. You know, where you know the artist came in and just. It's great, big, it's great, terrific looking panel, you know, great looking splash page or whatever it is. Daredevil doesn't have the strength to pull a door off a cab, but this artist didn't know anything, so, or didn't know that character at all. So to him, it was just another superhero. So why not? Big dramatic flourish. But an editor can either let something like that go, because I'm lazy and like, oh, I don't really know Daredevil either, but yeah, it looks good. I'm going to move on. <laughs> yeah, it looks good, right? Or did we do things here that might have broken the rules of, what Wonder Man does or how Pym uses his particles or um, Arya Man is going through all these things and you're, you're having him be too too jokey, 
you know, or something, you know, so you gotta, you gotta tone that down. That's not, that's not appropriate for the character or, you know, fill my puns, right? Cause that's easy. That's easy writing, you know, especially in the eighties and nineties, everybody's got a quip, you know, it's like, you're a funny guy, Sonny, you know, I'm going to kill you last, you know? Um, and, uh, but maybe that's not right. You know, it's easy writing. It's easy to write, uh, when I work, you know, for all the time I've, I've worked in advertising, you know, since comics, you know, there'd be a lot of, uh, uh, writers who were great with a, with a quip, right? They'd be great with a tagline, great with a headline, you know, something catchy, right? The same type of thing, but it doesn't actually deliver on say the product story, you know, the same way here, quips may not deliver on the character, even in a fill in. And as an editor, you have to maintain that responsibility of the character, that responsibility of the schedule, that responsibility of the creative team that you've got on there. And those may not be stacked in that order. <laughs> schedule may come first. Yeah. Creative team commitment may come last. Comically, comically, you, you know, uh, you know, I would, I would always laugh sometimes to their face at editors who would complain about the creative team and say, you know, uh, well, so-and-so, they're ruining Fantastic Four. They're ruining it. You edit Fantastic Four, right? <laughs> yeah. You hired them, right? Yeah. They're ruining the book. You're the editor, right? <laughs> you know, it's this recursive logic of fix it. You know, fire them or tell them what they need to do to fix it. So, but sometimes there were editors who were just along for the ride. What they wouldn't give the team notes or anything, or just... no? They they would they would just bitch about it, and they would say that, that it's horrible. I hate what they're doing. I hate it. Hate it. And and maybe that was a named team. I don't know. Sometimes that was the case. But on the other hand, you also need to exercise responsibility and get them, you know, on on track. Um, and that's what a that's why good editors are necessary. Um, and anyone who bitches about editorial, I don't know if people do that. I'm sure they still do, but. Um, you're, you're losing sight of an important part of, of your sounding board. You know, even if you are a creator or a creative team that has, um, say, a, a reputation and a name value, and maybe you're the one who people are really buying the book, you know, for, I can't think of an instance where you don't get some value out of a smart sounding board. Somebody who's on your side, who's reading it, who's looking at it, who's saying, objectively, I know you think these panel, uh, these captions or these word balloons tell your story. They don't, right? They're, they're missing something. Or maybe the art, I can't read. I've been reading comics 50 years or 30 years or whatever. I don't know what this, I don't know what these visuals mean. <laughs> you know, it's this jumble of panels and I don't know where you want my eye to go. But if we flop these two images and rearrange these here, then the eye could track and follow it. And that's part of what editors do as well. That observation. So no matter what, even if you have the greatest creative team ever, you should have notes for your team. Is that what you're saying? I, I think so. I, I think, yeah. I mean, as you said, there might not have been notes on this because it was just basically a yeah. hoo-ha action, you know, in, in the great Tom DeFalco tradition, you know, and, <laughs> which was famously, a, um, if you ever have a chance to talk to Tom, you, you should. He's a great guy and great oh, creator. And, and um, but that was always his editorial. Needs more hoo-ha action. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> and and, but yeah, I think editors, you know, you want to give something back. And, and sometimes that's also the way to read the room. Uh, I worked with one creator who I will not name, um, but, and, and a fabulous creator and a great, great guy. Um, but he had a psychological quirk where if you were really busy, say, as an editor, and he came in with two pages, you know, of his job or whatever, which he usually did, you know, and, and you were, and you were, oh, thanks, thanks. Just leave it on the, on the desk there. I'll, I'll look at it later. He would vanish, vanish for like three weeks. <laughs> and, you know, and you, where's the rest of the book? What's going on? I, I, and, but if you gave the time to pay attention and looked at those two pages and said, this is great. This is working so well. I love what you're doing here. You know, you, you, you gave him the attention to get the rest of the book the next day. You know, he just needed that, that kind of validation and that attention to sort of put into the rest of the job. He, he wasn't being uh, malicious about it, but it was sort of just a psychological thing. So you learn that, I think, as an editor, too, with certain people have a need there for levels of attention. 
and like at that time, like how many books like would a Marvel editor be, uh, you know, overseeing at one time? Um, I, well, outside of the X Men office, who was basically <laughs> Batman before Batman. <laughs> right, right, and and they might have been spread out, you know, between a couple of sub offices uh, as well. I I think um, I mean, I want to say seven to ten. You know, my you know probably probably which is wow. you know. Which is a, a fair amount of stuff, you know. Think about that—that that you're juggling not just the issues, right? That seven but to ten comics. The brand, yeah. Well, the brand, but also think about now. That's 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 four times the number of people per issue, right? You've got a writer, you've got a penciler, you've got an inker. I'm sorry, that's five. Letterer, colorist, right? So now you got five people times seven that you're juggling. So you're juggling all those people. You're trying to keep them all coordinated. You're coordinating. Uh, plot came in from, from Dan. Now that's got to go out to penciler X. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of moving pieces you're keeping, you're keeping track of and continuing and reading it, making sure it's, it's, you know, it's set up for, for success. So. And now we know why some writers become their own editors. (laughs) Well, but that's, that's, I, I, I think I'm extremely, uh, judgmental of myself. You guys have heard me ding myself and will continue to hear that, but uh, I, I cannot I cannot imagine a situation where a good editor is not going to give value back to even the best writer and, and artist on it. And so people who think they want to just be their own editors, you're going to miss something. You're going to miss something. Um, I, I, you know, been working on this thing for way too long now. Uh, <laughs> Nonsense. Um, Everything's we, a work in progress until Everything's a work in progress. But um, but I had written, uh, you know, some sequences where I was being ex- just really, I thought I was getting away from my old habits of overwriting things and it kind of underwritten certain scenes, you know, because I didn't think it needed anything. It just needed, like, the action was clear. The illustrations for the action were clear. Um, I didn't need to fill it in with beats or whatever, but I had somebody read it. Um, I had Greg Wright read it from an editorial point of view. He said, be, be as judgmental as you always are and, and really kind of rip into this. And, uh, so I was scared to actually show it to him. Um, and, and his editorial vision was you need to put more things in here. You actually need to kind of create some dialogue or caption beats because what's happening is, the reader is going to read this too fast. You know, they're going to, they're going to scan this page and take it in and go on to the next one. And you actually need to slow this down over here to get the effect that you want. You don't want this moment, the sequence of events that are happening to be lost on the reader and they will be. But in my head, I was like, I'm being efficient. I'm not overwriting. I'm letting the, letting the art carry the story, but in letting the art carry the story, it was losing some other effects. So that wasn't something. I could recognize for myself, and that's why I think, a, you know, an editor is, is necessary. And if you're if the writer who's editing himself is is going to miss stuff like that. Oh, that's what I was going to say. So yeah, so it's like even the best writer in the world, you know, you need that fresh set of eyes, that fresh sure. perspective. Yeah, mm-hmm. makes sense. But no, I was at, I was asking you about the uh, time you know, how long it took to get this issue published because it's like, especially with a team book, it's like uh, this thing has to have some kind of shelf life because, you know, they publish this three years from now. It might be like, oh, well, Tiger is not on the team anymore or, you yeah, know. Yeah, Iron Man's not on the team. Chris <laughs> Clearly, Clearly, it's it's dude, it's wearing a different suit of armor, yeah, yeah. Clearly, though, that was covered by the fabulous uh, framing device. You know, oh, that's know. true. Oh, I remember when. You know, I remember when these like, people were on the team. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. So it's like, okay. you know, like Wonder Man with this beard and, you know, his own walk. <laughs> I remember when the team was composed. Get around, children. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? So, so you've always got that crutch to to go with, I mean, or or you do it in a much more more elegant fashion. Uh, uh, you know, like the last last issue of Daredevil that me and Lee Weeks did. You know, before the the revamp, and you know, yeah. um, uh, what did Tim Tuey, the editor, put into the he put it into the uh, the credits box, I think, and something like a. Uh, a forgotten tale of, of Daredevil or something like that. So, you know, and he didn't have to do anything, but because it was literally the last issue of before the pass off to Kevin Smith and Joe Casada. So, yeah. um, but he decided to kind of take care of it in that, in that fashion. 
oh, you should have just been like, you know, writers, yeah, DG Chichester, Alan Smithy. I mean, just. I liked I liked that last issue. I had no I had no qualms. Oh no no no! I, I just it just as the, the inside gag, you know. Just, yeah. <laughs> maybe get two paychecks. You never know. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's like uh, that's the thing of the pandemic, right? All the people working two shuffles, three man. gigs. You gotta give them yeah, the shuffles. <laughs> uh, I swear, I had another question about this. Uh. It feels like you had fun with this issue, though. So oh, I think yeah. that's the most important thing. Is I, to I, just I, have I fun. think, yeah, I think absolutely. I think it was, it was, uh, I cannot remember really the specifics of it, but I think just in general, there's a sense of probably, um, of, uh, of, it's such a great collection of characters, too. Yeah, no, it's def- definitely. I mean, that was fun. It was fun to work with a group. It was fun to work with real characters. I think there's probably trepidation of like, geez, this is our, this is our big breakthrough chance to work with things let's not screw it up um so i'm sure there was some some sense of that but i think once we got into it and and had the even as cliched as the the rock star villain and the multi-dimensional things and the you know the goofiness of the pim particle and there were certainly plenty of times uh especially back in the in the day and i'd be at a convention and people would come up with this comic and like what's this what was the uh, whole theory around the catcher's mitt why did you like do this you know for because there's a ridiculous moment where pim makes a giant size catcher's mitt you know it so. was fun damn it yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and but I, I think we would have had a you know a good time just kind of riffing and going and there's no character development in this right it is it is pure action right from the get-go well get it it kind of has you to be. need a break from it. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, it kind of yeah. has to be. Again, it's a one and done. You know, you, you yeah. can't yeah. mess with the regular team's story. And right, 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 right. And just and just racing, you know, racing it forward. Um, but I think it also reads as, uh, you know, the sense of two people on the East Coast who haven't really traveled to California. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, has that sort of sense. It's a of very like, different Cal- culture. <laughs> California is weird. We don't really know anything about it. So, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we're just going to write it like this. Uh, rock, just rock stars and movie stars. Rock stars. Yeah, exactly. Here's the, you know, here's the LA, uh, the LA rocker as villain type thing. So rock stars and their drugs and their interdimensional portals. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I would have written it much differently. Well, though. LA is a hell, hell math. Hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. I live there. I can say that. You live everywhere. All right. Well, I'm from San Diego too, so take that one. <laughs> oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's where she was born. Uh, oh, so just so I'm clear. So, yeah. So when you like pitch like a fill in issue, like you had to go, there wasn't like a master list of like, oh, hey, we need a West Coast Avengers fill in issue. No, we need a no, whatever fill in no. issue. I, I, yeah. No, there, there might have been something in the editorial meetings, you know, where yeah. were and I wasn't I didn't usually go to the Marvel editorial meetings a couple of times I did, but um, there were, you know, larger groups of editors and they may have discussed needs issues needs for issues you know yeah. as it were we're running behind i'm gonna need a fill in somebody might have said oh so and so's up or i know you know uh, uh you know somebody might be free or have you thought about such and such if they were if they were being fair and trading secrets but from a a a a a, a, a creator point of view and this was this was the uh the benefit of being inside the walls. Certainly there was, there was a, an advantage to that, um, of being able to in between my day job, just going around and knocking on doors and saying, Hey, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to pitch something. You guys got, you guys open for something. And some offices be like, Nope, Nope, Nope. All covered. Don't want, or didn't want us or whatever. Yeah. And, and then chase us away. And then some would be like, yeah, maybe, you know, grudgingly, you know, here's something if you want to pitch for this, but you're still pitching. Right. You were doing you were writing a one or two page idea and then proposing that and then and then saying you get a you get a go ahead, you get a no go. So um, but it was a lot of that scratching at the doors uh, to try to kind of crack through. Yeah, that's why I just asked about the master list. I thought maybe it was just like, you know, no one's pitched us a West Coast Avengers fill-in issue. You know, we have 50 guys uh, pitching a Spider-Man fill-in issue every day. X-Men, so we yeah. Any, yeah, we don't yeah. need any Spider-Man or X-Men. We're awful. Yeah. Well, 
Well, but well, there was a strategy to that too. Certainly, I think that there, yeah. you know, you would you would uh, you would wisely sort of anticipate or try to wisely anticipate where where there might be more opportunity because yeah. that the low hanging fruit, as it were, would be the places where people didn't really want to do it. Everybody wants to work on X Men. Everybody wants to work on Spider Man, even as a fill in, because. Um, the fill-in would probably That'll still sell really lead well. <laughs> well, it'll lead somewhere, or it's going to sell well. And I you're going to get eyes on your writing, yeah. And you're going to get eyes on your writing. I mean, once I was more established, um, uh, and and then I was approached for some fill-in things. I mean, the two Wolverine issues I did, yes. I was approached to do those. Okay, those those were you know Bob Harris called up, said Larry's needs a little break. Larry's got to catch up on some stuff. You know, we need two issues. You know the. I was I was in the inner circle for all of like fifteen seconds, you, you know. Um, would you, you, used you, know, wisely, would you do this? Sir. And I you used did. it wisely, but I benefited also from the fact that Wolverine sold really well, mm. and I got some nice incentive checks for Wolverine for those two issues. Suddenly mm. saying, "Jesus, shit, Larry gets this every month," um, but <laughs> <laughs> and, and deserves it. Let's be clear, but um, but so you know, uh, but you would you would be more likely to find that there was nobody pitching the Thundercat story, the Defenders of the Earth story, the yeah. licensed property office, you know, what are they doing? If you're just trying to get yourself going, getting more of the experience of just writing a story to, to produce it, maybe you're getting back some editorial notes, you know, uh, just because the editor is doing Thundercats doesn't mean that editor doesn't have good story sense and can give you, you know, a sense that, your story is pretty well paced, but your dialogue sucks. So your dialogue is really crackling, but your pacing doesn't, you know, work. And you need to correct that. You're going to learn. You're going to keep learning along the way. So, um, from our point of view, we knew that we weren't going to get a lot of reception going after Spider-Man, but we would have more opportunity, thinking that nobody's really pitching Thundercats. Nobody's really pitching Defenders of the Earth. Nobody's really, p I mean, we're pitching. Um, you know, West Coast Avengers. And Howard was on both Justice and West Coast Avengers, so I can't remember which one we pitched him first, but he was definitely a door in to, hmm. uh, you know, more regular work, even though, you know, begrudgingly, I would say, you know, <laughs> you know stop bothering me, kids. And Howard's great. Give yeah, the old perfect. Steve Urkel, you warm down. Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> we wore him down. I mean, Scott really wore people down, but we, we, we did some wearing down in our own right. And would you Very say that's cool. like? I love these behind the scenes things. Like the the I business know. of comics is. I think it's still so very secretive too. Like especially like back in the day, people <laughs> have their like vision of what it was, and then like no 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 no. Let me tell you. <laughs> but no, I was going to ask it. Like, so would you say it's like a good creative exercise for writers to maybe write the character they've never really given that much thought to, or you know, over like the one? Oh yeah, I think about Spider Man every day, but it's just like you know. To hone your skills, maybe write a character you you know that isn't your favorite, and maybe you haven't given much thought to. I, I think that's a I think that's a great creative exercise. I think you're always challenging yourself uh, when you do something like that, as long as you're not trying to suddenly write the Hulk as Spider Man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love Spider Man. I know everything about Spider Man. I'm going to go write a Hulk story where I'm going to treat him exactly like Spider Man because they just end up with cookie cutter approaches to things. But I think that is a a, a strong uh, creative uh, way to to break your um, break yourself into doing things you know differently, uh, and and one of the long standing best creative tactics to try to make an impression on things was always to find the character that nobody cared about and and come at that from a different direction and and do something more with that and famously that can play out with a with a Sandman or a Swamp Thing right, right in that way nobody cared about Swamp Thing. Until I mean they did and then they didn't and then Alan Moore and and Bissett and, and, yep. and, and and <laughs> characters come in and nobody cared what they did with it nobody cared right I'm sure Karen Berger and company cared very much about the editorial but there wasn't as much scrutiny so suddenly you could tell a, a story about worms and you know reconstructions and all these things because nobody's really paying attention to figure out where to cancel this book in eight issues because uh, the sales are plummeting but here's a here's an open platform to kind of get in there and, and do what you, you want with it. But you, you definitely, um, 
and as you move into things like these fill-in issues, I guess you could write them as whatever you want. But uh, I know that the way Margaret and I approached it, um, even for this fill-in issue, we pulled all the uh, Marvel Universe handbooks off the shelf and we uh, we read up, okay, what is what do we need to know about Wonder Man? What do we need to know about Iron Man? What do we need to know about Pym? What do we know about Pym Particles? I mean, we did far more reading and research about you know, these 20 odd fill-in pages uh, than it, it, it warranted or probably came through on the page, but we wanted to feel informed and it was in our nature to find something, something that would be the little bit thing that we play with right here. Oh, Hawkeye's got these type of arrows. He very rarely uses them. Maybe this is something that we'll play out with. I, I don't know that we specifically did that here in, the, in this story, but that is sometimes where you find the little, the little hook or the little trick that, that opens up in other things. I mean, I would do that with Daredevil on my own, you know, later and the whole thing about uh, Fisk, you know, taking the, the, the bloody, you know, billy clubs and saying, I'm going to store these away for a rainy day when I really yep. want to torture them. You know, that would become <laughs> the jumping off point for me to say, well, whatever happened to those things, right? Um, and I could have done more with them, but I did enough with them to to make something of a story out of it. So, I mean, it's not necessary for to tell a good comic book story, but I kind of like that. Like, yeah, like the, the example you just mentioned where like writers like actually like reference back to stuff other writers have done like years previous and, you know. Mm-hmm. Because these it's aren't just, supposed to be the same characters having the same adventures over all these decades. So it's like, it, it kind of... Right. Helps. And it's an enriched universe. And yeah. it doesn't mean that needs to become overly burdened, but you have a lot of things you can draw from. And I think even doing... I think sometimes doing a fill-in issue, that's maybe even a more fun way to do it, is you find something there that is not going to change continuity or affect continuity, but allow you to play off something that's already established. Maybe not everybody knows it's established, but... The Once ones that do, do appreciate it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're, and then you can say to editorial, well, we're not saying anything that's not already real, even if you don't know about it. But. And uh, probably the, the tip to give to all up and comers is probably like you were talking before about, you know, if you can make a, the, you know, you take a lower tier book and make it like a big thing, like Alan Moore did with Swamp Thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, you could sell, you could sell a million issues of Spider Man. Yeah, who, who can? But you know, take it. You you could sell uh, five hundred thousand copies of Swamp Thing. Okay, kid, you got a job. You know, you got uh, right. but, employment. And and you have to strike a balance between the two if you're looking to break into one of the bigger companies and their yeah. properties. Where where does it come through? Picking the most obscure character that you're so in love with. And you may have the best idea ever for it is is probably too far afield in one way because mm -hmm. the first reaction is going to be, well, uh, uh, you know, why would we want to resurrect so-and-so? Maybe later on they'll do it. I remember pitching a Human Target, you know, series a thousand years ago. God bless and Archie, your soul. It, and, Archie, <laughs> and Archie was like, you know, Archie Goodwin, uh, you know. You were like, two well, decades too soon. Well, kind of, yeah, you know, he's, he's sort of, and he's like, well, who cares about that? Or what's, why, why would we want to bring that character back? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but, and I'm not going to dispute Archie's logic, uh, but, uh, uh, but that's way out there, you know, or was, you know, at that time. But if you strategically were sort of a look at different offices and say, uh, well, Phil's got five titles or seven titles that he, he edits on a regular basis, four of them are really successful three look like they're kind of stumbling along and maybe aren't as strong. Um, maybe I'll, and I know Phil's going to be at a convention. I'll go and I'll pitch this to Phil, you know, or, you know, in this way, or I'll contact him by email or, or whatever and say, you know, here, maybe there's an in, you know, in this way, because that's a character that seems like it's on its descent uh, or, or stumbling along. And maybe he's looking for an edge here, but it's already being published. So it's got some, you know, it's got something going on with it, as opposed to kind of just having to drag it out of out of nowhere and run with it. I, I mean, this seems to be the era, you know, if you have something, a pitch for some of these lesser known characters, because I mean, that seems to be Tom King's niche right now. I mean, he did that 12 issue Mr. Miracle series. Then he did an Adam mm -hmm. Strange. Now he's doing Human Target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Exactly. And 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 now he's got a yeah, track record, I guess, of doing that. So maybe that becomes... 
that becomes his thing. And that becomes something for DC, you know, PR to be able to play up, you know, more, right. You know, he's got a, he's got a track record of being able to take somewhat more obscure characters and find a fresh take. And, and that becomes a, a charge in its own right. But especially, but if you go to the Marvel side, I don't know if it's a kind of like a, a little bit of a trap these days where it's like, I don't know about the, if this character's not that well known, but they're not, and they're not getting there. They're not going to show up in a TV show or movie anytime soon. I don't know if we want to take a chance on this, you know, lesser known character. I, hard to say, right? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the, I have no clue what the editorial yeah, yeah, we're back to a billion X books again, so you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, what, so what's the editorial balance there? And yet there's no X Men movies, so that's not tied into that clearly. It's just tied into the fact it's it's X Men and they're yeah. they're they're doing they're doing well with that. So but it's always a matter of uh, you know, that might be a way in for creators if they get to conventions and they meet editors if there are editors at that shows, you know, to, to just ask about are there fill in issues? You know, like you said, it doesn't seem like there might be on the schedules, but I can't imagine there's. there's not. Um, but, uh, well, everybody's yeah. working so damn hard with eight books. So mm-hmm. <laughs> there's got to be a crack somewhere in the machine. <laughs> like literally, Cute. all, all, all like the all the big books, and then like all the creators are just literally like the same, like six people on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's got to be something. Uh, I would just think from again from a. a just a sheer publishing schedule point of view, I would think there's there's got to be a need for having that fill-in issue at the ready. But um, but then maybe the rest of it's running so efficiently, or maybe they don't need to worry about, as I said, the the gaps in the publishing schedule for some reason, as they used to. I think at Marvel now, you could pitch like 90s miniseries, because it seems like they're doing a lot of the <laughs> they're 90s. They're like, green light, go! <laughs> 90s are yeah. back. We know, Phil. We you know. know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I could go in and say, listen, the idea is... Midnight Suns with an O instead of a U. Uh, or, oh, no, just or. That, that's, that's all. That's all I have to say. You know, it's just. I know what I want to see a uh, mini series by DG Chichester set in that Daredevil '90s period. That's what I want. <laughs> I mean, come on, the dude's getting uh, more TV shows, so come on. <laughs> That's they right. Like, we'll see, they're definitely going to need a flashback season. Or hell, <laughs> hell, let him fill it. Hey, the, the king of the filling issues here. Let him fill in for Chip because I mean, Chip's got so much stuff going on now. At Daredevil, uh, he's going to be writing Batman. He's got his own creator stuff going on. I mean, you you know there was a Defiler Daredevil story. You know, um, at some point, you know that was always going to be uh, the case. I'm shocked that Untold Tale to- that we finally <laughs> <gonna get> him- <laughs> <laughs> the Untold Story. Ah, uh, and just just for nostalgia's sake, you have to, you have to put on the cover Daredevil's greatest battle, <laughs> greatest battle ever, right? You with thought the kingdom with, was bad with a little nineties, you know, Wonder Man, you know, enough said, you know, coming out. Of the <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, all right. Any other questions for this man, Will Hellfire? No, sir. Let him have his great Saturday. Well, thank you, guys. Always a great way to start the Saturday with the two of you. Thank you again. And uh, what's my assignment for next uh, next time out? Do you have it? Oh, the first assignment is to have safe travels. Well, thank you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. hopefully. hopefully. Uh, but yes, next month, uh, the Punisher uh, Captain America uh, story, Blood and Glory. Yeah, I got oh, a lot wow. of work to do on that one, actually. Oh, okay. All right. Wow, that's a that's a that's a good bookend to this. Because that would be the last thing that me and Margaret wrote together. And Oh, uh, really? And so that would be uh um and there yeah, a lot of his a lot of history behind that one. So um uh that's a that's a that's a fun one. We'll we'll definitely we'll definitely chew the microphone on that. <laughs> Captain America and Mr. Competent himself, Frank Castle. <laughs> I don't that know which a, one I was rooting for the least, honestly. <laughs> that, was, that was uh that was well we'll talk all about that. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I have, if I can find my uh my full set of how to kill and the anarchist cookbook, which were kind of my, my Bibles for uh writing all the castle scenes. That nice. <laughs> Yay. All right, before we go, uh sir, tell everyone about the uh newsletter and every, anything else you have going on. Uh um uh, Newsletter, oh, you find it. Too, yeah. Yep, I was going to say it's uh, storymaze.substack.com is my my newsletter, and uh, if you're in the Northeast area, the Connecticut area specifically, I'll be at Terrificon at the end of 
July. Uh, so I'll be there for Saturday and Sunday at the show. Uh, please, if you're in the area, drop by and uh, say hello in person. And bring a comic. <laughs> bring a comic, exactly. <laughs> bring West Coast Avengers 38. <laughs> All right. Again, thank you, sir, so much for uh, thank you guys. This was fun. This was. I wasn't sure we were going to be able to fill the time with uh, this, I, but I, we, you we should we know this by it. now. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> All right. Well, good, good grief. I say to you both, and uh, and have <laughs> <laughs> yet. Catch you later. Thank you, sir. Be good guys. Bye bye.